Welcome to my second lesson on the Internet. In my last lesson, we covered many of the basics of the Internet, including the history of the World Wide Web, exploring and customizing the home page, doing searches on the Internet, and email. If you are new to the Internet and haven't seen my first lesson, I suggest you view it before continuing here. In this lesson, we will learn how to use and customize Microsoft Internet Explorer and discuss some of the issues and options regarding security, viruses, and online privacy protection. We will learn how to use AOL Instant Messenger to chat with friends and family. Finally, we will explore powerful sources of information on the Internet using news groups and bulletin boards. We will continue using Microsoft Windows as our operating system, but based on the version of Windows you are using, your screen may appear slightly different from the one in this lesson. The premise will be the same, though, so you will still be able to follow along. I want to remind you that the Internet is a dynamic place. Some sites we visit in this lesson may not look the same or even exist at the time you are viewing this lesson. Even so, what you learn here will help you as you visit other sites on the web. And remember, due to the fact that we won't be waiting for web pages to load, we will arrive at some sites faster than you will be able to access them. Feel free to press the pause button on the video professor screen to stop the lesson at any time. And press the play button when you're ready to continue. At this time, I'd like to reintroduce my student assistant, Suzanne. Just follow along with her, and soon you'll be using the Internet with confidence. I assume you are signed on to your ISP account at this time and ready to go from your home page. We'll begin this lesson with Internet Explorer. Let's take a look at using Microsoft's Internet Explorer browser, also known simply as IE. Notice the title bar at the top of our screen says Microsoft Internet Explorer. Most Internet providers use IE, or a customized version of this program, so your screen should look like Suzanne's. If not, the things we cover should be available somewhere in your browser, and the tools we are going to explore can be found and used the same way. Remember from our first lesson, a browser is the interface that allows us to do things on the Internet. On the main menu bar, click Tools, and from the drop-down menu, select Internet Options. This window is where all preferences and options are set for Internet Explorer. We could spend hours setting up options, but the Explorer program has already set most of the options for us to have a great Internet experience. There are a couple of areas where we should know how to set our own personal preferences. Let's take a look at them. The General tab is already selected, so we'll begin here. Under the General tab are three important areas, Home Page, Temporary Internet Files, and History. Suzanne's home page has already been set up for her, and the Address window shows her ISP home page address. As we discussed in my first lesson, the home page, or start page, is the first page we see each time we log on to the Internet. We can return to our home page at any time by clicking on the Home button located along the web toolbar. This will give us a quick way to return home while surfing the net, no matter where we are. In my first lesson, we learned how to type in a new address here to change our home page. You can also click Use Current to change your home page to whatever page you're currently at. Next, the Temporary Internet Files section is a folder that stores exact copies of web pages we have visited while online. Click the Settings button in this section. This window has several functions. Along the top, we can set how often Explorer checks for newer versions of stored pages. We are given four choices. Every visit to the page, every time you start Internet Explorer, automatically, and never. Click the radio button next to automatically if it's not already selected. 
This option will automatically check a web page against any copies that might be stored in the temporary internet folder and update the copy to the newer version. Right below that is the temporary internet files folder area. Located next to current location, it shows us where the temporary internet file folder is stored. Below that section is a window showing the amount of disk space to use for saving these files. Suzanne's is set to 596 megabytes, but yours will be different. We change this either by moving the slider bar, typing the number into the field, or using the arrow buttons next to the field. I recommend setting this to at least 40 megs. Depending on how much free hard disk space is on your computer, you may want to allocate less if you have limited disk space. If you did a lot of research on the web, you might want to make it larger to store more of the pages you've visited. As we view more web pages while online, the older pages will automatically be deleted to make room for the new ones. While we're on the subject of storing temporary files, all computers contain temporary storage locations known as caches. This process known as caching speeds things up by allowing data such as web page text and graphics to be stored in a place where it can be quickly retrieved. You'll probably never know when you're using a cache, but it's always there, speeding up your time on the Internet. At the bottom of the settings box, we can click Move Folder and change the location of the temporary Internet Files folder. Ours is just fine, so we will leave it alone. We can also view files or view objects. Click the View Files button. A new page opens, and we now have access to the temporary Internet files. We could use the main commands to delete or copy any of these files. Scroll down the list. As we can see, there are a lot of stored web pages. We might also see graphic files, cookies, and a variety of other Internet files. I'll discuss what cookies are in a little while. We can tell the difference between these files by looking at the file type. We'll find the type column heading in the bar that runs right above the window listing the files. A web page will be labeled as HTML. GIF images are graphics from a web page, and a JPEG image is a high-quality photograph. In the column to the right of the file name is the Internet address. If we were curious about what a particular site was, we would simply double-click on the file name to view it. Depending on your computer setting, we could get a warning message that it might not be safe. It usually is okay, but use your own discretion. If we try to open a web page from here while we are offline, it will not be active. Close this window by clicking the X at the upper right corner of the window, and we're back at our settings window. The View Objects option will display the plug-in programs we have downloaded off the Internet. We have the same options for removing these files, but unless we know what we're doing, it's best to leave this option alone. Click the OK button to return to the Internet Options window. To the left of the Settings button is the Delete Files button. This button allows us to delete all the files in our temporary Internet folder. This is useful if we're running low on disk space and need more space, or if our computer seems to be running slow. On the other hand, having these temporary Internet files can speed up the downloading time when we access web pages we visit often. This is because our computer can access and display the pieces of that web page from our temporary files folder on our hard drive and not have to transfer and download the entire page from the Internet every time. The next button over, Delete Cookies, will remove cookies that are stored on your computer. A cookie is a piece of information sent by a website computer to a user's computer and stored there so the user's preferences are remembered for future visits to that website. The main purpose of cookies is to identify users and possibly prepare customized web pages for them. Cookies may include information such as login identification, user preferences, or online shopping patterns. Let's say you personalized a weather website to display your local weather, or an entertainment site to show TV times for your favorite programs. This is where cookies will remember your preferences. Like Internet files, some cookies are helpful for sites that you visit often. Other cookies are used for advertising purposes and some people feel they are an invasion of your privacy.
It's a personal decision whether to remove them, but many people come here from time to time to clear cookies off their computer. However, you need to be careful here, because if you do remove your cookies, you may lose something you want to keep, such as your local weather settings or your personalized TV program schedule. At the bottom of the box is the history area. The history folder keeps track of websites that we have visited in the last few days or weeks. You may remember that we identified the history button on the web toolbar in my first lesson. Clicking it opens a pane displaying recently visited sites. The history section can be set to keep displaying web addresses for as many days as we wish. 20 days is the default, and that will work for us. To change the number of days kept in history, just click the up or down arrows to add or subtract days. We can also clear the history at any time by clicking the Clear History button. Below the history area, we can change the colors, fonts, and language of web pages. You can return and explore these on your own, but for now, let's leave them at the default and move on. Go to the Programs tab and select it. Here, we can specify programs for other Internet services, such as newsgroups, HTML editor, and others. These are advanced settings that we won't need to change now, but this is where you would go if you needed to make any changes. Go back to the General tab. Let's look at a quick way to get information about what's on this screen. See the question mark next to the Close button on the top right corner of this window? Click it. And a question mark is now attached to our cursor. Say we want to know more about Delete Cookies. Using the mouse, move your cursor down to Delete Cookies and click the question mark on that area. We now get a pop-up window with a brief explanation of what a cookie is and what the button will do. The pop-up window will disappear when we click Anywhere Else. We can use this help feature whenever we want to know more about a feature or button displayed in this window. Move over and click the Advanced tab. This page allows us to turn on or disable certain functions of Explorer. Notice some options have check marks and others do not. These default settings were set for us when Internet Explorer was installed on our computer. As you become comfortable with your computer, you may want to come here and make some of your own choices. But I advise you not to change anything that you're not sure about. Let's start with a browsing section and look at a couple of settings as we work our way down. Scrolling down alphabetically under Browsing, underline links should be set to Always. This allows us to easily see links because they will stand out on a web page. Keep scrolling down until you get to Multimedia. If you want to speed up your download of Internet pages, we could turn off some of these settings like animations, sounds, or pictures. Find the box marked Show Pictures. Disabling this feature by unchecking the box will speed up the downloading of web pages as only the text will appear. This is helpful if we are in a hurry to find the sites that have the information we want. But the downside to this is that a lot of graphics are links to other sites. If we cannot see them, we won't know they are there. And in general, pictures on a website make it more interesting and fun to browse. We'll leave these settings as they are. Go ahead and close the Internet Options window. We'll return to Internet Explorer options later in this lesson and explore some of the other features. Let's move on to our next subject, security and viruses. In this section, we will look at how we can keep our computer and our personal information secure while using the Internet. As more people use the Internet, online security is becoming an important line of defense against ID theft. The more we know about how to protect ourselves, the less likely we'll have our identity stolen and used without our knowledge. When we log on to the Internet, we join a worldwide network with millions of other people. More and more people are making purchases, arranging travel, paying bills, 
and banking online. But if we use an internet connection that isn't secure, information like our name and address, email address, credit card number, and social security number can be taken illegally and used to make purchases or misrepresent us. Fortunately, there are ways we can protect ourselves online. One of these ways is to deal with companies who protect their customers. Let's look at how one company keeps personal information more secure from this type of abuse. In the address bar, type in www.rei.com, just as you see it on the screen. REI is a popular outdoor clothing and equipment store with locations across the country. They also have an active online store. Along with outdoor gear, they also offer their own Visa card. Scroll down the left-hand column and under the category Services and Membership, click Apply for an REI Visa. This page tells us about the card and displays a link for applying for a card. Click Apply Today. You may get a pop-up warning you about security here. Click OK. We're now at a secure page. Just like when we visited the banking website in my first lesson, two things on this screen tell us we're at a secure page. In the address window, the HTTP has been replaced by HTTPS. The S tells us that we're at a secure page. And we now have a closed or locked padlock displayed at the bottom right corner of the screen, another sign that this page is secure. If we continued with this credit card application, the following pages would be secure as well. Remember, whenever you see these two indicators, you know that any information sent from that page is converted into a secret code through encryption and is safe from unauthorized use. Our information can be decrypted by the recipient, in this case the bank that manages the REI Visa card. If you don't see these signs, be careful when sending information. I suggest that in general you only send personal information when you know you're at an encrypted site. Many websites have a section describing their security and privacy policy. Read it over and then decide whether you feel comfortable sending personal information through that site. Click the down arrow to the right of the back button and from the drop down list select your home page name to return there. Click Yes if you get a security pop-up. Let's move on to our next topic, viruses. A virus is a software program written by someone with the intent to damage other people's computers. It can be as simple as a prank played on a coworker, or it can be powerful enough to destroy an entire network of computer systems. Viruses can lock us out of our computer, corrupt our system software, or even wipe all the data off our hard drive. When a virus program is written, it is usually hidden within another program. When that program is run, the virus is activated and can attach itself to other programs. Computer viruses, like human viruses, can easily enter the system and make the host sick. Viruses can be installed onto a computer from a CD or floppy disk, or they can enter our computer through a network or modem connection in the form of an email file or other downloadable file. How do we know when our computer has a virus? We don't always know right away, but soon we'll notice our computer is acting funny, doing things differently than it usually does. This is when we might suspect a virus. Fortunately, there is powerful antivirus protection software available that can keep our computers free of viruses. Some of the well-known programs include McAfee Virus Scan and Norton Antivirus. I strongly recommend getting antivirus software and installing it on your computer. These programs will scan your computer for viruses and clean them from your system. The companies who provide antivirus software will also have periodic product updates. Install these and your computer will be more protected against attacks from new viruses. Along with using this software, there are a number of things we can do personally to reduce the chances of a virus attack. First, be very careful when you open email and attachments. If we know who sent an email, it's usually safe to open. However, they could be unknowingly sending an attachment that's infected, and there are even viruses that can enter a network and send email with an attachment from one user to other users on the network. 
If we open the attached <laughs> file, our computer could become infected. This is where our antivirus software comes in handy. It will detect the virus and protect our computer against infection. <laughs> Email attachments from unknown senders are potential <laughs> carriers of viruses. Many internet users automatically delete all email from unknown senders as a precaution. See who's listed as sender and decide whether to open the email. I suggest as a general rule that if you don't know the sender, don't open any attachments that come with the email. Even if we do know the sender, it's possible that a virus program could send you an email and attachment from their address without them knowing about it. If in doubt, you can always contact the sender and ask if they sent the email. And be aware that what's in the subject line can mislead us as to what the email really contains. Often the subject line is used by the sender as a teaser to get us to open our email. All this talk about viruses and infections and destroyed files shouldn't make us paranoid about using the Internet. We just want to use caution and common sense when we're checking email, buying things, and having fun surfing the Internet. This will ensure that we'll have a great experience using the World Wide Web. Having a current version of an antivirus software installed on your computer will help keep it virus-free. If you work for a company or organization that has a network of computers, chances are good they have additional protection in the form of a firewall. A firewall is a combination of hardware and software that protects a network from outside traffic over the Internet. Firewalls do this by detecting and blocking unwelcome emails, viruses, and attacks from hackers who try to break into the system. This ends our discussion on security and viruses. Let's continue to the next section, Online Privacy Protection. In this section, we're going to look at protecting our privacy online and placing parental controls on our computer that restrict your children's access to undesirable websites. We'll also see that cookies are not always good for us or for our computer. As the Internet becomes easier to use, more people are going online. It's tempting to think that the Internet is a sophisticated place where our privacy is guaranteed, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. The Internet is a public place where people can eavesdrop. Watch your surfing patterns and see what products and services you like. If you're in a chat room or a news group, your comments can be read by almost anyone. And even email is not as private as we'd like to think. Our email can be forwarded and shared among people we had no intent of sharing it with. But there's no need to feel overly concerned every time you log on. If you use some common sense and follow the guidelines I'm going to discuss, your Internet experience will be as enjoyable and useful as it is to millions of other people who use the World Wide Web every day. Let's begin by clicking the Tools button to open the drop-down menu, then selecting Internet Options. We spent quite a bit of time here earlier, but this time we're going to look at a different option. Click the Content tab at the top of the box. At the top of this window is the Content Advisor. The Content Advisor allows us to place restrictions on web pages based on what was formerly known as the RSACI rating system. RSACI stands for the Recreational Software Advisory Council Rating System for the Internet, also known as RASKEY. We'll refer to it as RASKEY for this lesson. In 1999, RASKEY was folded into a new organization, the Internet Content Rating Association, or ICRA. The goal of ICRA is the same as it was under RASKEY, to protect children from potential harmful content while preserving free speech on the Internet. The system provides consumers with information about the level of sex, nudity, violence, and offensive language in software games and websites. The rating system can be set up easily on your computer within a few minutes. Click the Enable button. We now have access to the Content Advisor. The Content Advisor allows us to set or change the level of specific categories. We should all be open on the Ratings tab, 
If you aren't, select it. Look in the category window. It displays RAS key with the subheadings language, nudity, sex, and violence. If RAS key isn't highlighted, select it. Now look down at the bottom of the Content Advisor window. It shows a short description of the RAS key rating system. There is also a More Info button. If we wanted to see more information on the RAS key and ICRA rating system, we could click here. Let's move back to the Select a Category window and click on Language. Notice the rating slider that just appeared between the category and description areas. We can use this slider to change the rating level for each category. The slider is set to level 0, allowing no profanity to be viewed on web pages. Using your mouse, drag the bar to the first marker. This is level 1 protection, which allows mild expletives. If we look in the description area below, we can read what each level entails. Move the slider once again to level 2. Level 2 allows moderate expletives. Now, slide to level 3 and 4, and we can see those descriptions. Let's slide the bar back to level 0. Click on the other categories, Nudity, Sex, and Violence, and you'll see more descriptions for each of the five levels. Select the General tab. The General tab allows us to set user options on our RAS key rating system. The User Options area has two settings. The first allows the user to see sites that have no rating. The second will allow restricted content to be viewed by using a supervisor password. It is important to know that this system is fairly limited. Since RASCII is a rating system, it only works on sites that have been rated. Sites that have been rated will have a RASCII icon or an ICRA icon on them. If we click in the first box, all the unrated sites will then be available no matter what their content. If we leave it blank, we can only access rated sites. This means we won't be able to access very much of the web. In fact, these rated sites only include a fraction of the sites available on the web. However, this includes some excellent sites that are made for kids, such as www.netsmarts.org and www.cybersmartkids.com.au. These sites are also excellent places for parents to go and find additional links to other children's sites and learn more about how to keep children safe on the Internet. By leaving this box unchecked, we prevent our children from getting online and accessing undesirable sites while we're gone. The Supervisor Password section will allow us to set up a password. With a supervisor password, we can change settings or gain access to sites that have been blocked and turn the content advisor on or off. We can also change our password if we need to. We still need to know our old password to do this. We'll see how to create this password in a minute. We can use the two rating systems buttons to find and use other programs that rate sites. Use the Find Rating Systems button to explore other parental control programs. There are a number of these programs available on the Internet, which look at the content of all web pages, even email, and block the pages that contain content we want to restrict. Some popular child protection programs are Norton Internet Security 2004, Cyber Patrol, and Net Nanny. These programs could be bought over the Internet from their respective websites or from software stores. The Rating Systems button is used to activate the programs in Internet Explorer. Let's open Create Password, which will let us create a supervisor password. Click that button. This password will keep children from accessing the Content Advisor and changing settings on their own. Click in the first field and type a password. It should be different than our login password. Make it something easy to remember, but not easily guessed, like a name or number. Now tab down to the next field and confirm it by typing our password again. Before we click OK, notice the box labeled Hint. This is where we can type in a word or phrase that helps us remember our password. If we do forget it, we can come here for this reminder. Click OK or Cancel if you don't want to set up a password at this time.
If you choose OK, click OK again to close the confirmation box telling us the password has been created. Remember, if you enable a password and then forget it, you won't have access to sites you may want to visit. I suggest writing down your password and keeping it in a safe place. Click OK to close the Content Advisor window. Another box appears, telling us that Content Advisor has been enabled and how to change and check our Content Advisor settings. Click OK. And we are back to the Content tab on the Internet Options window. If we did click OK, the Enable button on the Content tab will now say Disable. We can use our password to disable the controls and have full access to the Internet. I'd like to stop for a moment and mention another powerful tool for protecting children online. Education. We can help our children stay safe on the Internet by teaching them a few important rules. Actually, some of these rules are good for the rest of us as well. First, never give out personal information such as address, phone number, or name or location of school. Never let your children get together with someone they met online without your permission. And they should not send anyone their picture without checking with you first. They should never give out their password to anyone, even their friends. Have them tell you if they get any messages or information that makes them feel uncomfortable. Teaching children the right Internet skills will go a long way toward keeping them safe while they're online. I want to show you one more option for privacy control. On the Internet Options window, click the Privacy tab. This is where we decide whether we want to allow cookies to be saved on our computer. As we discussed earlier, cookies are small files that some websites store on our computer. These files contain information about our identity or preferences. They are sent to our computer when we connect to a website that uses cookies. Cookies have a few drawbacks. They do give some personal information to websites. This information is used for demographics and tracking our web surfing habits, which could lead to receiving junk email without our consent. Cookies also have the ability to see which programs we have installed on our computer. This information can then be used for sending more unwanted email. But cookies can also be useful. They can let us take advantage of special features on a website, such as remembering our choices. An example of this is when we set up our preferences at the Weather Channel webpage in our last lesson. And unknown to us, they placed a cookie on our computer. Now, every time we log on to the Weather Channel, it looks for the cookie that it placed on our hard drive and reads the information in it. The website then displays the settings we picked for our local weather. Here in the Privacy section, we have control over how many cookies are saved on our computer or if we allow them at all. We can even allow or block cookies from individual websites. However, some websites will not allow access to their content unless cookies are allowed. Let's look at our options. Back on our screen, we have a slider bar with six settings on it. These settings range from block all cookies to accept all cookies. Pull the bar up or down. As we move the bar to different settings, a description appears to the right of the bar explaining what each setting does. I want to explain three terms we see here. A compact privacy policy is a condensed computer-readable privacy statement. First-party cookies are cookies from a website that we are currently viewing. Third-party cookies are cookies from a site other than the one we are currently viewing. Cookies from third-party sites usually provide content, like advertising, for the website we are currently viewing. Setting our privacy level is a personal decision. Read through the descriptions for each setting and determine which level is best for you. I suggest that for now we select one of the settings in the middle levels and see how it works. If there are some websites we want to apply different privacy settings to, we can easily override our overall privacy setting for those individual sites. Click on Edit. The Edit button will not be highlighted and accessible if you chose either the Block All Cookies or Accept All Cookies options. Here we can add websites to a list that will not be affected by our privacy settings. For each site, we have two choices. We can either Always Block or always allow permission for these sites to place cookies on our computers. 
Let's give it a try. In the address of website box, type the complete address for the website we want to add. Suzanne, type in www.barnesandnoble.com. Now click Allow. Barnes & Noble appears in the Managed Websites window. From now on, if the website attempts to place cookies on our computer, it will always have permission. Let's see how to remove a site. Click on Barnes & Noble to highlight it. Now move over and click on the Remove button. And Barnes & Noble is no longer on our Managed Websites list. Click OK to leave this area. We can come to the Privacy section at any time to add or remove websites or to change our general privacy settings. Let's talk about a couple of other ways we can protect our privacy. If someone contacts you by email or phone saying they need to verify your password or credit card number, chances are someone is trying to run a scam on you. Don't give out this information. Should you receive such an email or phone call, contact the company directly via phone or via the Internet. Protect yourself against online fraud and identity theft by carefully screening and deleting unsolicited email messages that ask you to visit an imposter website and provide personal information, such as a password or a social security number. If you suspect you have provided confidential account or personal information to a fraudulent website, call the customer service phone number on your bank statement immediately and report it. Along with not sharing your ID or password, another way to protect your privacy is by changing your password regularly. Online shopping is another place we need to be especially careful. Just because they have a website doesn't mean they are a reputable company. As we discussed in the last section, do your homework and know the company before handing over your credit card number. And finally, don't believe everything you see on the Internet. If an offer or deal seems too good to be true, there's a good chance it is. If you're in doubt, trust your instincts. Don't let these warnings discourage you from enjoying your time on the World Wide Web. If you follow the rules we've discussed here, your privacy will be protected and you'll have a great experience on the Internet. Let's close out of the Internet Options window by selecting Apply and then OK. This concludes our session covering online privacy protection. Let's move on and look at two very popular features of the Internet, Instant Messenger and Chat Rooms. Instant Messenger allows us to chat live with our friends or family when they are on the Internet. It's a bit like having a phone conversation using our computer and monitor. Except there's no phone charge for our online chat. We type our message and send it. And it appears on the other person's screen seconds later. And since the conversation takes place in real time, we don't have to wait for the email servers to send and receive a message. Before we go any further, we need to sign up for a screen name so we can use AOL Instant Messenger, the program that we will be using as our messaging program. And from now on, let's call it IM for short. IM is available for free from the AOL website. Go to the address bar and type in www.aim.com, AOL's Instant Messenger site. At the top of the screen is the AOL Instant Messenger button. Click it. The AIM Express box opens, asking us to sign in. If you have an AOL account, you can use that screen name and password. If you have another ISP, click the Get One Free button to get a screen name. This box lets us create a screen name. Starting at the top, we'll fill in the information fields, following the directions shown. Millions of people use IM, so we need to use a unique screen name. We can create a screen name using a combination of words, letters, and numbers. Some people like to refer to a hobby or interest when creating their name. Suzanne, for our screen name, let's try Suzanne Q VP. Viewers, go ahead and choose a screen name. Then type in a password and complete the remaining fields.
If you need extra time, feel free to pause the lesson at any time. In the word verification box, enter the word shown at the bottom of the box. When you're done, click the Submit button. If you get a message box stating your screen name is already in use, click OK to return to the screen name box and try another name. Here's our confirmation telling us this screen name will work. Click the Continue button. A small box titled Buddy List appears on our screen. The first thing we need to do is create a list of online friends. This will be our buddy list. For us to chat with our friends, they need to have IM on their computer and have a screen name too. Then, when we're on the internet, we can see when our buddies come online and we can chat with them privately. Most likely, we know our friends' IM screen names, so we can add them to our list. Click the Setup button toward the bottom of the Buddy List box. Now click the Add Buddy icon in the lower left corner of the box. A highlighted name box with the words New Buddy opens under the Buddies folder. Type your friend's screen name in this box and press the Enter key. Remember, your friend must have an AOL screen name for you to communicate with them. Suzanne has now added a buddy to her buddy list. Let's send the friend an instant message. Close this window and return to the buddy list. From here, it's easy to send messages. But first, we have to see whether our buddy is logged on and able to receive our message. Look at the buddy list window. If Suzanne's friend is online, she will appear under the buddies folder. And her screen name will appear in regular font. And if Suzanne's buddy is offline, her name will not appear. Remember, she has to be logged on to the internet and have IM turned on before we can send a buddy an instant message. It looks like Suzanne's buddy is online because her screen name appears under the buddy's folder. We can now send her a message and when she gets it, she can respond back. Double click on her name in the buddy list. This automatically brings up an instant message box on our screen. Suzanne's buddy screen name appears in the To field. All she needs to do now is type her greeting message to her friend and click the Send button. The instant message box will stay open, and when her buddy replies to us, the message will appear in this same box. While we're waiting for her to reply, I'll stop for a moment and mention a fun tool for helping us send messages online. Find the little happy face icon displayed between the two message fields on the toolbar and click it. The 16 faces displayed here are called emoticons. They can be inserted anywhere in our text to add emphasis or clarity and to convey emotions that might otherwise not be obvious in our email. Just click on our message in the dialog window whenever we want the emoticon to appear. Then click the little face on the toolbar to open the emoticon box and click the face we want to insert. The emoticon will be placed in our text and included when we send our instant message. As long as our buddy stays online, we can message back and forth for as long as we like. Let's look briefly at how we can set up privacy controls for our IM account. Go back to the buddy list box and click the Settings button at the top of the box. Scroll down the drop-down menu and select Privacy Settings. This is where we set up our privacy preferences for IM. There are a number of options available for controlling who can contact us through IM. On the left side, we can select who we will allow to contact us. And the right side lets us block users we don't want to contact us. By choosing the last option in each column, we can allow or block individuals' access to our IM by typing in specific buddy names in either of the two boxes below the options. Let's change our preferences. Select the second option titled, Allow Only Users on My Buddy List. If you'd prefer to let all users have access to your IM, just leave the first button on the left side selected. Click Save to Close. Then go ahead and close our buddy list box.
Now we can send and receive instant messages, add new buddies to our list, and choose who can send us messages. Keep in mind that with instant messaging, the same privacy rules we discussed earlier apply here. Be careful about giving out personal information online. And be aware of whom your children are communicating with while on the Internet. Before we move on to our next section, I want to take some time and discuss chat rooms. Chat rooms are places on the web where Internet users can come and talk with each other in a real-time conversation. We can sit at our computer and talk with people sitting at their computer just about anywhere in the world. The number of chat rooms is staggering. They exist on many sites throughout the Internet and deal with any subject we can think of. Since we've been using the Google search engine, let's see what we find for chat rooms there. Click the down arrow to the right of the address bar and select www.google.com. Type chat rooms in the search box and click search. It appears that Suzanne's search pulled up well over 5 million sites dealing with chat rooms. Some chat rooms are free. Some are free, but you have to register to get into them. And others require paid memberships to join. This is one way to find chat rooms, but we'll need to be more specific to find one that matches our interests. There are quite a few chat rooms available through Yahoo, so let's return to www.yahoo.com and look around. Go to the Groups of Links on the left side of the page under the search field and click Chat in the Connect category. It looks as though Yahoo chat rooms are the type where you need to sign in to join. We already have a Yahoo ID and password from my earlier lesson, so type in your ID name and password in the fields at the top of the screen and click Sign In. That logs us on to Yahoo Chat, where we have a long list of chat categories on the left side of the screen. There's an area here where we can set up our favorite chat rooms for quick access and add friends' names to contact them quickly. Before we jump into our first chat room, I want to warn you about some of the things you may encounter in them. Because they are so easy to enter, chat rooms are often visited by people who aren't as much interested in the chat subject as they are in getting attention or being disruptive. It's not uncommon to find people going off the topic, using vulgar language, or being abusive. Chat rooms can also be targeted by spammers, who post advertisements and announcements for their products. While some chat rooms are fun places where people gather to talk about common interests, others can contain some unpleasant interactions. For this reason, I recommend closely monitoring children's chat room activity, and teaching them about privacy and safety. Kids love to chat, and these rooms aren't always the best place for them. You may find that chat rooms requiring a fee to join are more likely to stay on topic and have fewer disruptive people in them. Keeping these things in mind, let's look at a chat room. Click Family and Home. Here's a list of chat rooms associated with Family and Home that we can enter. Click on Gardening. A drop-down menu appears, and it looks like there are several chats going on here. The numbers next to the smiling faces tell us how many people are currently in the chat room and how many of them have audio or video connections. Click on Gardening 1. And Yahoo begins connecting to the chat server. If you haven't opened Yahoo Chat before, one-time voice chat download and install pop-ups may appear. Click Yes and Continue on all pop-ups that appear. And we're now in the chat room. The main screen is called the conversation pane. It's where the actual chat displays. It scrolls up as people post messages, like an ongoing conversation. To the right of each message is the name of the poster. And on the right side of the message screen, we see the member list pane, showing everyone currently logged on to this chat room. Clicking on one of these names opens a message box where we can write and send an individual message to that person. By right-clicking on a person's name, we get a list of options such as sending an instant message, 
or adding them to a friend list for easier contacting. Whenever someone joins the room, their name appears on the screen. Let's join the chat. Viewers, feel free to sit back and watch if you like. Suzanne, click on the Compose pane below the message screen. And type in a brief message. Click the Send button. And our message appears on the screen as the newest posting. We're now part of the ongoing chat. I mentioned earlier that some posters may post inappropriate or offensive messages. Some chat rooms have moderators, people who monitor activity in the room and have the ability to deny entry to people who don't follow the rules. Over the last few years, many chat rooms, especially those without a moderator, have become places where undesirable information is common. For these reasons, use caution when exploring chat rooms. Occasionally, there are temporary chat rooms set up with celebrities, elected officials, business leaders, or other people who are willing to answer questions and interact with the public. These events, often known as auditorium chats, feature questions submitted electronically by the audience to a moderator, who then selects certain questions for the guest to answer in chat format. Auditorium chats are closely moderated and can be informative ways to learn more about those people and the issues they represent. They're often announced on websites related to those people and on major news websites such as MSNBC's events chats. It's time to leave the Yahoo chat room. You can click the exit button on this page or just close the browser window to leave. Let's move on and look at some other ways to communicate and exchange information on the Internet. So far, we've discussed email, instant messaging, and chat rooms as tools for communicating on the Internet. But those aren't the only ways to interact with people on the World Wide Web. There are a number of other powerful tools that allow us to exchange information on just about any topic imaginable. Have you ever had a question but didn't know where to find the answer? Using the Internet, you can communicate with people and get information and opinions on even the most obscure subjects. There are many thousands of groups on the Internet who gather to discuss subjects or areas of mutual interest. Think of a topic, and there's probably a group somewhere devoted to discussing it. These groups welcome people to join and interact online with their members, or merely read the ongoing discussions. It's like a virtual coffee house using computer screens to carry on conversations. Unlike instant messaging and chat rooms, these groups are generally not live interactions. The postings are displayed for a period of time so everyone can see. You'll hear these groups referred to by different names such as bulletin boards, message boards, discussion groups, news groups, and forums. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between them as many of them share similar features. What's important to know is that these groups are all powerful examples of how the Internet brings users together. People tend to find groups that interest them and subscribe to them as you would a magazine. By subscribing to specific forums, people can keep up to date on what is going on in their areas of interest. There's often no cost for this subscription. In most cases, you don't even have to be registered to browse around and read the discussions posted on a particular board. But subscribing or registering does allow you to participate and post your own messages there. If you need an answer to a question, posting that question in the right forum can often get you the answer within a day or two. Let's go to a bulletin board. In your address bar, type www.atkinsdietbulletinboard.com and press the Enter key. Here's a bulletin board devoted to discussions on all aspects of the Atkins diet. At the top of the page are buttons that will take us to places such as frequently asked questions, books, an online store, and recipes. In the table below, we can see a listing of the different forms on this board. 
The first column on the left displays icons telling us whether there are new postings here or if the forum is locked to new postings. Moving to the right, the column under Forum shows the general category and a brief explanation of the discussion. The next column displays the number of topics contained within each forum. The Posts column shows the number of times people have posted responses to these topics. And the last column displays the newest post made within a forum. Judging by the recent date and the number of posts, this seems to be a very active bulletin board. Forums are divided into several categories. Scrolling down the page, we can see the sections on dieting, specialty groups, miscellaneous discussion boards, food and recipes, and a technical section about the board. Below the last section, there is information such as how many registered users belong to this board and how many users are currently online. At the bottom is the login section where we would sign in if we were a registered user. More about registering in a minute. Scroll back to the section titled Specialty Groups. Here are a dozen different special groups under the Atkins Diet umbrella, ranging from teens and supplements to success stories. There's even a Spanish language forum. Beneath each form is a description of the discussion that takes place there. Click the exercise link. Here are the actual topics contained in the exercise form. The layout is similar to the previous table. Beginning at the left, the topics column tells us what the discussion is about. Moving to the right, replies displays the number of replies to the original topic posting. If there's a zero in this column, we know that no one has replied to the original posting. Author is the screen name of the person posting the original message. Views tells us how many times this topic has been looked at. The final column on the right, last post, shows the time of the last posting, along with the name of the poster. Scroll down to the bottom of the page. And we see that this is the first of 13 pages on exercise discussions. This is a popular subject. Move over to the bottom right corner to the Go To Page section. This is where we can click on a number to move through the pages of this forum. Suzanne, scroll back up the page and click on the topic titled, Anyone Ever Try Pilates? Viewers, if your screen looks different than hers, go ahead and click on a topic that has more than two replies to it. Here's the original posting, followed by all the responses. People have joined the discussions from across the country, replying at any time of the day or night. When we post messages to these groups, there are some general rules to follow. We need to use proper netiquette. Netiquette is short for network etiquette. Many forums are very specific about what subjects are and are not appropriate. For example, posting an irrelevant message is considered rude or bad netiquette. It's a good idea to read through the topics list before posting a question, so you don't waste people's time by posting things that have already been said once or twice before. Other things to avoid are posting advertisements or typing your message in all capital letters. One of the major reasons we want to use good netiquette is to avoid being banned from the group or being flamed. Flames are sarcastic attacks on our general intelligence, opinions, judgment, and ignorance of netiquette. By understanding general netiquette guidelines, we can get the most out of our experience with forums. We'll learn much about what is appropriate and what isn't by just sitting back for a while and observing what goes on in our favorite forum. In general, it's best to treat people and their opinions with respect while participating in online groups. Those who don't follow the rules can be removed from the group by the moderator and no longer able to sign on and post messages to the board. Suzanne, let's see if we can send a reply to this topic. Click the Post Reply button. A login screen appears, but we don't have a username or password for this site. That's one of the requirements for many discussion groups. You need to register before you can participate. It's usually free, so let's look at what it takes to join. Find the small register button just above the login area and click it. Here are the agreement terms for registering on the site. We are told what kind of postings are not acceptable and inform that this forum system uses cookies for improving our viewing experience here. 
Click the first button at the bottom agreeing to these terms. The registration information page opens, where we would fill in the four required fields at the top marked with an asterisk, and then click the submit form at the bottom. That's all it takes to create an account on this bulletin board. An activation key would be sent to our email so we can confirm we want to be registered on this site. At that point, we would be able to participate in the online discussions on the Atkins Diet Bulletin Board. We won't register at the Atkins site, but I think you get the idea of how easy it is to join. Most message boards and discussion groups that require registration operate in a similar way. These sites make the process as simple as possible. Let's look at another bulletin board. Click in your address bar and type www.travelerspoint.com. Here's a travel website offering information on everything from worldwide destinations to travel insurance. It also offers a way to communicate with other travelers. Find the forums link at the top and click it. Here is the Traveler's Point forum page. It looks a bit different from the Atkins Diet site we just left, but the general layout is similar. At the top are links for reading the rules of the forum, logging in, and registering to join this forum. Below this section, the specific forms are divided into general travel, regional travel, and community discussions. On the right side, we're shown the number of threads, or individual discussions, in each forum, the number of postings, and the date and time of the last post in that forum. If you're a traveler, this is a great place to do research on a destination and get advice from people who've been where you want to go. Let's say we're planning a two-week trip to Southern Europe, and we'd like some ideas on creating an itinerary. In the Regional Forum section, click Europe. Here's the Europe Forum, beginning with the most recent postings. The left column contains the subject of the thread or discussion. Clicking it will bring us into the thread. To the right is the screen name of the person who started the thread, followed by the number of replies to the original posting, how many times it's been viewed, and when the last post was made to the thread. Scrolling down the page, we can see several threads that might be of interest to us, such as postings about Spain, Portugal, and France. Some of the threads have zero replies, which tells us no one has responded to the original question or comment. These are identified with a dash in the replies column. More replies on a thread often means that the topic has started a discussion. Let's look at one of those. Your screen will look different from Suzanne's, so feel free to sit back and watch here, or follow along by exploring a topic of interest to you. Click the thread, What to do with two to three weeks in Spain. Here's a nice, ongoing discussion where people have replied to the original post, asking for a suggestion on things to see in Spain. Above the first post, we can click links to log in to the site, or join if we're not yet a member. The process for joining this discussion group would be similar to the one we looked at for the Atkins site. After joining the site, you can post your own messages asking for suggestions on your travel plans. As I mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to read some of these postings to get a feel for the culture of this group before submitting your own post. Suzanne has already joined the forum and she's just logged in to demonstrate how to post a message. Here in the European forum, she has several choices. By clicking on a thread, the window that appears now has a button for posting a reply. Click that button and a reply window opens where you can type in your response to the thread. When you're finished writing, Suzanne, click the Preview button. The Preview window opens, showing us what our message will look like. If we want to change anything, we can click the Edit button. And if we're happy with our post, we can click the Submit button, and our message will be added to the thread. Suzanne, click the Europe link at the top of the page, and we're taken back to the page of Europe Topics. This page is also where we can post a message to start a new thread. Click the Start New Thread link. This window is almost identical to the post reply window we just left. To start a new thread, just type in the message, then proceed through the preview, and then submit, just like we did a moment ago.
You'll find the process for submitting postings to other forums is similar to this one. Once you're a registered member, it's pretty straightforward. Let's look at another type of form. For this part of my lesson, we'll return to a familiar site, Google. Use the down arrow to the right of the address bar on your History button to navigate there now. On the Google homepage, click the tab labeled Groups, right above the search field. Here we have a partial list of discussion forum categories. There are categories for Business, Humanities, Science, and other areas that aren't currently displayed. These forms are slightly different from the first two we looked at. They're often referred to as news groups. You can tell a news group by the unique extensions in their internet address, such as talk.environment, alt.airlines.schedule, and rec.gardens. Since news groups started before the creation of the World Wide Web, they don't have the www that we're used to seeing in their web addresses. News groups are part of Usenet, which began in 1979 as a way to carry local news between two universities in North Carolina. In the beginning, scientists used them to exchange information with other scientists interested in the same subjects. Today, Usenet is a worldwide system of tens of thousands of discussion groups with millions of users, and anyone on the Internet can participate for free. Google is one of a number of places to access Usenet discussion forums. As we'll soon see, each Usenet group has a unique name. Often, it's easy to figure out the focus of a group just by looking at the name. Let's take a look at some of them. Click the REC link on the right side of the list. REC stands for Recreation. This is the category for forums that cover recreational activities such as games, hobbies, and sports. There are 50 groups listed on this page. Next to each group is the number of subcategories within these categories. While we're here, notice in the upper right corner there's a prompt labeled Next 24 Groups. If we clicked on it, we would go to a second page that listed 24 more groups. Let's stay here and look at one on this page. Since we've already explored a forum focusing on diets, it's time to indulge a little. Click Rec.Food. This page currently shows 13 different forums in the food category. Let's look in rec.food.chocolate. Click that option. We are now in the chocolate news group under rec.food, which is a forum devoted to chocolate. Based on the line above, the thread subject heading, there are more than 15,000 threads or separate discussions about chocolate. This page shows us 25 threads, starting with the most recent posting to the discussion. Since people post to forums constantly, Suzanne's screen will look different than yours. That's okay. Everything I'm discussing here will relate to whatever is currently on your screen. Our screen shows the date, the thread subject, and the screen name of the most recent poster. On the right side of the screen, we'll see a prompt labeled Next 25 Threads. This would take us to the next list of postings in this forum. Let's dive into one of the threads on this page and see what's happening there. Suzanne, click on a thread that tickles your taste buds. We're now in the thread where we can read all the articles that have been posted here. At the top of the screen are links for going to the previous 10 postings and for jumping to the beginning of the thread. These links are also available at the bottom of the screen. From here, we can send an email directly to one of the people who have posted a message by clicking their email link. Or we can post a message to the entire news group responding to this message. The column on the left side of the screen displays the subject of the thread, the screen names, and the dates when people have posted to this thread. Clicking one of the names will take us right to that posting. After reading through messages, we can click the back button and return to the original thread page. In the upper right corner, we can begin a new subject or ask a question to the group by clicking the link titled Post a New Message to rec.food.chocolate. By the way, you may have noticed by now that when we open a thread or posting and then leave it, that message heading will be a different color than the others. This means that that posting has been read. 
We can now enter newsgroup forums, read postings on thousands of subjects, and participate in discussions whenever we like. Let's take a shortcut back to the Google Programs page. Click the down arrow on the right of the address bar. Here's the history of addresses we've typed in the window lately. Move your pointer down to google.com and click it. We are taken immediately to the Google Start page. Now click the Groups tab, and we're back where we started earlier in the lesson. I want to show you a quick way to navigate right to the newsgroup subject area you're interested in. The Groups search window works much like the one we used earlier when we did searches over the entire web. The difference here is that instead of our search combing the entire World Wide Web, we will search only Google's groups. Let's do a search on a subject we'd like to learn more about. Suzanne, I know you have a new puppy, and as a first-time dog owner, you could use some tips on how to housebreak your new pet. Go to the search window and type in puppy housebreaking, and click the Google search button. Well, it looks like we picked a popular subject. According to the screen, there are over 9,000 threads here. On the left side above the list of postings, we're given a couple of news group names related to our query. Each posting shows either the first few words of the posting or a subject. The date of each post is listed, and Suzanne's screen shows some pretty old dates. We aren't seeing the newest postings for this subject, but we can fix that. Look on the right side of the screen under the number of results found and find the two links, sorted by relevance and sort by date. On Suzanne's screen, sort by date is underlined and highlighted, meaning that the other option, sorted by relevance, is currently active. This list is organized by relevance to her query. Go ahead and click sort by date. The list instantly resorts and now the newest postings are on top of the list. In glancing over these subjects, they don't seem to be quite what we want. Let's go back to our first list. Click sort by relevance. And we're returned to our original list. Let's click on a posting and see where it takes us. This should look familiar because we're back in another thread. The subject is different from before, but the format is the same. We are now at the first posting in the thread. This is the entry that started the discussion. From here, it's easy to display all the other postings to this discussion. In the upper right corner of the screen, there is an area labeled View. Next to it is a highlighted prompt where we can go to view the complete thread, containing all the articles that were posted in response to the original posting. It tells us how many articles are in the thread. Click the Complete Thread link. Here are all the responses from dog owners interested in the puppy housebreaking question. As you can see, people here have gathered online to share ideas and information about a topic they're all interested in. Just like our searches for diets, trips to Europe, and chocolate, we could spend a long time immersed in the world of dog training. And we can come back here anytime, day or night, and look up our own areas of interest. Click the Home button again to return to your Start page. We've visited four different discussion groups in this section. And by now, you've seen that this is just the surface of a vast pool of information available on the Internet. As you explore the web, you'll continue to discover more sources. This concludes Lesson 2. We've covered a lot of topics, and by now you should be even more comfortable using the Internet to communicate, find information, and do business. When you're ready, let's move on to Lesson 3. Thank you for being such good students. And remember, there is always more you can learn from me, the video professor. <laughs>